See the candle? Push forward, there you See go. the marshmallow? <laughs> Don't be the marshmallow. That's the safety talk. Thank you. All right. So we have a candle and we have a blue thing. What do you suppose the blue thing represents? A jellyfish. It does have a certain similarity, doesn't it? Okay. Yes, the credits of Nova. Okay, what this is, what this particular slide is all about is what we need to organize fire so it does what we want it to do. The little blue uh, jellyfish looking thing. Does anybody, actually, does anybody recognize that picture? This is the opening credits of Nova. <laughs> Go ahead. No. Um, it's a human aura. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually a, a She's saint. playing guess what the no. teacher's thinking. I am. Um, I just, some people have seen this. So there's two huge things that we use for making fire work, right? We use the heat rises principle, which is convection, and we use the heat that moves like light principle, which is radiation, right? Conduction comes into play also, but it's, it's not as easy to describe visually. So this is a candle burning normally, where convection is bringing cool air in the bottom, and exhaust products are heated and move out the top, right? Self-organizing under gravity, right? This is a very similar candle. Same candle. I would argue almost, it's out of the same batch probably, this being a picture from NASA. This is a candle burning in the absence of gravity. This is the best picture they were able to get of a candle burning in the absence of gravity because it turns out they don't work as well. They're kind of designed for a particular situation which is anywhere on the surface of the Earth. And when you take them up in something like a space shuttle or an international space station, and you try to get them to work, there's a critical element missing that was there when they were designed. But so what you can see from this, even better than from trying to stare through the flame of an ordinary candle, is that it's not the wax that's burning. You don't see flames wandering down the candle in the absence of gravity. It is the vapor that's coming off of that wick. That wick is the center of the flammable gases that that candle is burning. And the air in zero G, just kind of hangs out over here. Uh, they actually have to have fans running when the astronauts are asleep so that they don't suffocate in the cloud of their own breath. Um, and so this candle's suffering the same situation. You got air here, you got warm fuel here, but only on this little interface where they meet can they actually burn, right? And so in an ordinary candle, you got air constantly coming in. That fuel is being dragged up by the convective flow of the air. And so you've got this huge range where there's not just enough heat to burn. Like this is this, the low temperature burn at the edges. But there's this smear of really bright incandescence where that, those carbon particles are burning not quite as hot as the sun, but they're getting, they're getting within a reasonable fraction of the temperature of the surface of the sun and glowing. And that's why it gives off so much beautiful light. Right? If you want to heat something off a candle without getting it sooty, you put it above that visible top of the flame after the particulate's been burned away. If you want to collect soot off a candle, maybe you want to make some ink or, I don't know, write your name in it. Um, you can put a plate down in the flame and interrupt that process, cool that carbon before it's fully burned. And you can collect soot off of a flame by putting something in the flame path. This is why a short cook stove where the pot's in the fire always turns the pot black, right? So I love this picture, and I love that this is also from NASA. This is a microgravity drop tower test. You can, you can make these yourself. Digital cameras are now cheap enough. You can put something in a box with a camera, turn the camera on, drop the box. This is a 132 meter tower. So getting one of those might be a little bit more expensive, but you can borrow someone else's probably. Um, and the real design trick is being able to get the picture off the camera after the end of the experiment. Um, if you're very good, you can use the camera again as well. Um, so this is, a, this is a 
clay bank reproduction of that jug stove that we talked about. Um, the idea of just digging a simple fire pit in to use that natural airflow to channel the heat together, focus the flame, and give you a smokeless warm spot at the top. Up there, you can put, here, let me see if I can do that down here, right up here. Um, you can put the teapot for one of those Maasai cook stoves. Okay, so this is a, a, a quick and dirty reproduction of a Maasai jug stove. There it is with a little bit more fuel. We have lots of fuel, not a lot of termite mounts. So it's, a, again, a different design context. This is a picture that I borrowed from one of the primitive skills sites. Um, if we give you the slideshow afterwards, I don't have permission to share this picture. Uh, but I do have a cutaway drawing. So this is the Dakota fire pit idea. It's a beautiful picture. Um, and this is a cutaway of that fox stove, uh, which we were talking about. If you take away that chimney, then you have what he's built to be a Dakota fire pit. Okay. This is the good stove uh, as built in rural India. Um, this is their diagram from, and I, I do have permission for these, um, from uh, their, their basically very simple building process, all with square adobe bricks. Um, you can see some of the people who use this type of stove, and you can see that they're working in a very well-ventilated situation. If you're up high enough that your houses are sealed and insulated and you don't have a temperate climate all year round, then you're also going to need the added expense of putting a chimney on it to carry the exhaust out of the kitchen. But in a, in a house that's this well ventilated, a stove that burns this cleanly, um, pretty much takes care of your indoor air quality problem to the level that's affordable. Um, we tend to put in the metal box stoves um, with a chimney going to the outside because we tend to have much better sealed buildings in the temperate and northern climates. So this picture is in here because there is a box stove. They put the box stove in there because this is the second story of a pole building, right? And this is at Mountain Home. Uh, the interesting thing with this picture is that all of those walls are thermal mass. So they're still using the thermal mass even though they're using a box stove to heat the space, okay? I think the south side is wood with Earth yep. and plaster, and the north side is a straw bale insulation or straw clay insulation, which is a straw bale. Um, so just different ways to use thermal mass. Oh, and they've also, they've also put a cob wall behind the stove. It's similar to the idea of a trom wall picking up your solar heat, but it's just a little earthen wall right near the stove, so the heat that's not being used, this is just a hallway to an exterior wall, um, is being stored. So even though it's not a super efficient stove, they're increasing the heat storage and, and making a longer, uh, heat storage acts like a thermal flywheel. You get some momentum going, it stores the heat and it extends that heat longer. It provides that momentum after the fire's gone out. Okay, so. um, and I'll make a note on that part. Somebody remind me to talk about the thermal <coughs> heating options at the end of this because there's a few things that North Americans really have a problem with when it comes to thermal heating options. This, this is the cheapest EPA approved stove that could be acquired in this area. Uh, this is in Nevada, I believe. Yeah. This is two inch thick stone around a metal chimney. That it's is a two decorative inch thick, facade. Thick stone. Thing, yeah. And so it's a decorative facade that's meant to look, it's a wall high. It gives you this massive appearance. And it's this thick. And the actual chimney is in the garage. And it's basically a metal chimney with a little air gap and then some drywall around it in the garage. So there's no heat storage whatsoever, except for the two inches right above the stove where it gets warm. <laughs> okay. um, and it's built with a fan. So the idea is that it, the heat goes in the stove and then the air comes through and it feeds the stove and it comes out these little holes and it blows warm air into the room. Because that's how you heat houses, right? You blow warm air at things. Now this is an EPA approved stove. EPA approved stoves currently are designed so that you cannot cut off all of the airflow to the stove because we don't want airtight stoves these days. Creosote because fires, right? They make creosote fires. Well, it turns out that the most effective way to run this stove to heat your house 
is to leave five inches of ash in the bottom and build the fire on top of that. And the reason is, is five inches of ash means that you have blocked up all of those ventilation, those, those Basically, nice it's a fans. homemade vernacular um, damper <laughs> that's working against all of the air intakes that are built into the lower part of the stove for the fresh air coming in. You've still got the air wash over the door, you've still got the design ventilation when you, you know. And so they can run it longer. They also have a little damper that partially closes down the chimney. Um, and so the trick with a stove like this, if you want to burn efficiently, is to adjust the adjustments that you have and then go outside and look at the chimney. And when you get to the point where you've got it not smoking, but approaching that burn rate that you're looking for, um, then you just go in and watch the fire for 20 minutes and listen to it and get used to what the, the feel is of how that fire is working at that point. Go out again, check for smoke. Um, something like, I mean, the, the oven is a basic box to put a fire in. Uh, the dome ovens are actually, again, that, that reflector shape that's going to reflect heat evenly downward toward what you're baking. So you put a fire in it, charge up this, uh, this inner layer right in here is that earthen thermal mass. And then the outer layer that has all this straw in it is insulation. So you're charging up the inner layer with the heat from the fire, getting it very, very hot. 800 degrees or so for cooking thin crust pizza. And then you scrape the ash out into a metal bucket um, and the coals that are still burning. And you put your baked goods in and all of that stored heat charges it up. You can see how much smoke those put out. If you put a smoke hood and a chimney over it, not only do you get less smoke in your face, um, but if it's designed carefully, you can actually burn most of the smoke by giving it a more coherent flame path that that makes the smoke stay in the oven longer, produce more heat in the oven, and send less particulate up the chimney. So there's, a, there's a, also a little secret to, to uh, that whole deal. It does not slot. have to be made like a frog with lipstick, by the right. way. That, was, that was a natural paints class that we told to yes. go to town and we would paint over it afterwards. Um, so you, the slot in the door, in the burn door there, is the same cross-sectional area as the chimney is, okay? Something really important to keep in mind, even though you have cooling gases, keeping that same cross-sectional area, not going bigger and not choking it down, is going to give you a cleaner burn all the way around and more consistent result. Uh, I, I, it drives me absolutely nuts to see um, these wood stoves that they've got now got a converter so you can shove this mechanism in to make them into pellet stoves and uh, you've got a chimney this big around for a fire this big around and they tend to put out carbon monoxide like nobody's business and they can't figure out why maybe it has something to do with a chimney this big around for a fire this big around because you've got all that dead space you're drawing a lot of extra air through when you're cooling the fire. Yep. This is another oven, similar design. You've got, so you can, here you can see a little bit better. You've got the dome, and then you've got this front area with the chimney. There's actually a second door that you close for baking to trap that heat without letting heat out the chimney while you're baking. This is a Rumford fireplace. Uh, for those of you who have been to Mount Home Homestead, you would recognize this. This is in the, in the courtyard. That is Rumford Fireplace in Tahoe. No, the Rumford Fireplaces typically have a flush hearth, and this is during the building process, so the, the, the hearthstones haven't been added yet in front of the fireplace. So this ledge will be filled in, and that fire is shedding this beautiful glow of heat and light is going to be coming all the way across the floor at floor level. Um, yeah. There is some um, decanting of the very slightly. This is not part of the original Rumford design. He tended to do a flat back and bring the throat into it and make the narrow throat like that. Um, some of the more recent variations on the Rumford have a slight slope. It does two things. One is sometimes it's convenient to be able to put a smoke shelf in when you're refitting an older fireplace to bring it forward and then drop back for a smoke shelf if it's just a slight refit. Um, and another thing is that slope will tend to catch the smoke 
a, the, a flat works very well, but a slope will tend to catch it a little bit more aggressively. And it will also tend to shed heat, again, in that straight line. So you're shedding a little bit more heat toward the floor from that sloped surface. Um, the downside is that then when you get to the throat, you've got some smoke that's angling toward the mantelpiece instead of straight up the chimney. And so you absolutely need to get that nice smooth curve under the mantelpiece to, to make sure that you've got that little laminar flow curtain of, very thin curtain of room air that's going to catch any smoke and bring it up without turbulence. If you get tumbling and turbulence where the smoke meets the room air, then you have to drop the opening down. You lose a lot more of your heat trying to catch that smoke under a, a fume hood. And you know, room for fireplaces are all radiant heat. Okay, so the more angles you can put in there and still run the, run the fireplace so that it's smokeless, that will, sh that will reflect that heat out into the room, the better off you are. Up to a point where you've actually taken so much heat out of your exhaust that it won't rise anymore. Um, this, is a, this is a nice compromise there. Uh, the other thing with this, and the reason why I put that slope back in rather than go straight up, is that the clients that we built this with decided at the last minute they were going to give me soapstone. So this entire Rumford fireplace is soapstone. Is that bad? No, it's a, that's it's excellent. A, <laughs> it's a very high it's, density thermal storage material. It's almost as dense as water. It's five bucks a block It's for a brick sized block. It's, it's, so it's two to three times the cost of fire brick of the same size. And it's, yeah. the, it's the thin blocks. <laughs> um, for a Rumford, Rumford like to make them reflective, insulative materials, whitewashed, reflecting out into the room, designed for parlors where you're only needing heat while you're there. And so you're producing this reflective, instant, high quality heat and light. And then when the fire goes out, uh, you, can, you can shut a throat damper and the, the fireplace is done. You've heated the chimney a little bit, your upstairs bedroom off the chimney may be a little bit warmer as a result, but they're mostly designed as a parlor heater. Um, so this is a hybrid. These, these little dots that you can see are screws in covers for clean outs for a thermal mass storage bank behind the fireplace. So the fireplace is actually working as a preheater for a thermal mass, a uh, rocket mass heater. Uh, it's, a, it's a very complex build and I wouldn't necessarily recommend duplicating it, but this was a unique situation with an extremely large old fireplace in the center of the house. So that all, if we had built a thermal mass heater anywhere else, we would have had a warm mass competing with a cold mass to heat the house. And so we, so we built this in to heat the mass of this extremely large fireplace. Does that make it clearer? You can kind of see what's going on with a little bit of slope here, curve there, and the fan radiating heat out as opposed to a box pushing heat inward. So I have a quick question. Would it be effective to do the first layer of bricks, like soapstone, like that thermal brick, and then putting um, fire bricks as a second layer to kind of keep Behind it? it? Yeah. If it was mine, I'd probably have just gone with fire brick. Yeah, I'd have just gone I, with fire brick. Soapstone is, is beautiful stuff for thermal mass, but that fireplace is going to... Um, there's, there's no particular reason to, to go for a, a, that much more of an expensive thermal mass in that setting. Is it harder and more durable? No, uh, it's softer it's, and less durable. It's softer, it's mostly talc, okay. but it's non-porous. I mean, they used to make chemi chemistry lab sinks out of it. It's a really interesting material. It's a, it's a beautiful material. So it's the closest thing as far as thermal mass, it's the closest thing to water that we have for thermal mass. Water but it'll, is it'll, considered the best thermal mass. But it'll tolerate the high temperatures where water won't. Right. right. Uh, you'll see soapstone lined wood stoves where there's a couple inches of soapstone on the outside to extend. Like if you can get a six to eight hour burn and then you put a couple inches of soapstone, now you're looking at eight to ten hours of heat from that six to eight hour burn. So it's like just, it's, it's big bang for the buck if you're using small quantities of thermal mass. Uh, you'll see the Tula Kiwis that are soapstone masonry heaters about this big. So again, something that can be refit into an older home. Um, high-end elegant solutions. So this is some of Rumford's own drawings. No, this is, this is from a masonry heater guy on the east coast, a Rumford builder. 
Let's let's go past it. Okay. I think the other diagram shows it more clearly. That is a very small Welshman in a very small picture in a very small room. <laughs> Anton doesn't like cameras that much. So we get the pictures of them that we get. So this is roughly Anto's this is this is the first poster that we made for our second workshop together, I think, or it might we made it made it for the first one and this was taken at the second. So you've got what you saw outside fuel feeding downward, fire moving sideways, heat rising up. Um, you're going for the same cross-sectional area. So this is a little misleading. It's not quite to scale. Um, but this is typical. If you've got a say an eight inch diameter duct, you've got a square the same cross-sectional as that circle, so you'll have a little, you'll, you'll overlap inside and outside the corners. Um, this is all insulated so that it focuses the heat in toward that fire, get that fire up to temperature as quickly as possible, and keep it at as high a temperature as you can while it's in this turbulent mixing firebox. Um, you sometimes get a reburn at the top if that flame path is bouncing off that barrel, you'll get a little bit of an effect where it'll swirl unburned gases back into the flame briefly. And then this whole barrel surface is shedding heat and acting as a, a, a downdraft. So you've got an updraft, downdraft, thermosiphon pump. It's like a trapped convection cell. Like the, like, you, you guys watch the turkey buzzards rising on the thermals? And then you can soar down almost anywhere. Right? But there's these sort of up and down currents in the weather cells. So you've got basically created one of these that you can keep in about a 4x4 four four space. It's kind of cool. Can you give examples of how you would insulate that? Uh, what? Mineral wool refractory insulation is easy to get and works well, especially for this part. You can wrap a little wire cage around it and uh, it works pretty well. Uh, Yanto's original is a perlite insulation which will handle up to about 2300 Fahrenheit, which when it's lined with brick, no problems there. We like to mix that perlite with clay slip so that you can actually compact it a little bit and it doesn't tend to settle or spill over time. And uh, then the, the wrap around the heat riser. You can do that too if you put a solid, like a, like a metal. Um, a 12 inch duct yep. with, an eight inch, with an eight inch core and you pack perlite and clay in there. Works just fine for you're, a cast in place heat riser. Yeah, you basically, you can, this is showing a cast in place perlite heat riser where it's, um, the, whatever you use for a liner is likely to burn out over time. Um, and that's actually kind of an ugly process because it'll burn out up to about here and then you've got weird flaking blistering metal above that that's kind of draggy. So uh, we favor, you can, you can get refractory, cast refractory tubes. Um, that you can use, or I mean, now we just tend to go with either thin fire brick or whatever reclaimed brick you're using. So just do the whole heat you reaser. Don't the metal, you don't need you don't need any any metal except something to hold the insulation on the outside. And that on this side, you're cool enough that even a galvanized piece of sheet scrap will be fine. In here, you're up in the 2,000 degree range, and you can get much hotter. I think we've got I mean, we we've got melting on stainless steel in certain situations, like we're looking at, tw that's 2,900 Fahrenheit. Uh, so we're getting into the 3,000 range at certain points at certain times in the burn cycle. Um, so any kind of metal in that intense of a, a clean fire uh, is just not your material of choice. You'll notice a couple of things on both of those that we don't do anymore for <coughs> pretty doggone good reasons. Um, the ash pit, if you put an ash pit in your eventual stove, you will find out very quickly why you don't leave it in there. And in fact, you'll be dropping a brick in there very soon because all it does is tend to smoke back into your house. For some reason, the ash pits, while they might be a good idea, they don't work as well in execution as they do in, in uh, theory. You, we, and we talked outside about why an air intake anywhere except here tends to produce smoke going up both chimneys. Uh, we also don't tend to use this uh, feed barrel anymore um, because it traps smoke, as we talked about outside, and because it makes it very difficult to get in and clean the ash out of the fire pit. We tend to clean ours out every two weeks to a month. Uh, we recommend when you start to do it every day just so you get a sense of how fast your particular fuels are building up ash. Um, if you use a lot of paper, we've had people heat their house on junk mail for months at a time. 
Uh, you, but you're going to have a lot more ash, and you may even need to clean it out and burn twice a day rather than being able to clean it out once a day or once a week. Um, this is an annual clean out. The fly ash that makes it up the heat riser, if you're not burning junk mail, if you're burning anything other than clay treated printer paper, um, you, you can build a big enough ash pit here pretty easily to make it an annual clean out of the fly ash there. And that acts as a settling pond so you don't have fly ash making it all the way down into your horizontal pipes. And these pictures aren't showing the other stack that is not yet. Is driving yeah. All this. No, this is just the combustion. This will drive itself in the absence of weird pressures. Yes. But the absence of weird pressures is not very common in the real world. Um, and then this is your heat storage where you're moving that exhaust through earthen masonry. Uh, we, we had a hand raised in back there. Okay. I, oh, I need to remember my question. <laughs> um, so what do you recommend in terms of building it into the mass heater if you don't have that little ashtray at the front, like for cleaning out the... We just reach in. You just, okay. It's, it's, uh, Ernie uses his hands. I will sometimes use like a little square sardine can. It, it extends my fingers a little bit, and I don't like to get soot under my fingernails as much. What about a shot back? A shot, shot back. back will work, but actually a little bit of ash on the brick tends to make your brick last longer. It yeah. insulates the fire. Fire stays hotter. Brick get, doesn't get quite okay. as hot. That's, so. that's something that I should probably say. A little bit of ash in the burn tunnel is a good thing. Taking all the ash out of the burn tunnel is a bad thing. I'll Believe me, even a Franklin stove has a problem burning if you take all the ash out of it. I'll tend to build my burn tunnels when I have the option. A lot of the times it just depends on how wide the bricks are and what the thickness of a course of bricks and mortar is. Um, but I'll tend to give them up to a half an inch of extra depth if I can so that I can let the ash build up to half an inch and run it that way. Sacrificial layer kind of thing. Just a little extra space so I don't have to clean it as often and, and so that I know I don't have to do a thorough job cleaning it. Um, if you're building it for yourself, it's just a question of what you prefer, how you prefer to run it. This is a pocket rocket. This um, is uh, yes. this particular pocket rocket. People will have often noted that uh, the thing sticking out of it as a chimney is yes, it's aluminum. And I yes, learned, it did melt shortly after this picture was taken. Yes, just so people know. <laughs> um, but this is the this is the fuel feeding downward. Lots of mixing chimney drawing upward version that, that you referred to when you were showing your stove where you changed this instead of a vertical angle, he put a shallower angle on it so he wouldn't deal with smoke pack. If you've got a chimney that's like a six inch chimney and you've got a six inch feed, you don't get a lot of smoke back. If you've got a small chimney and a big feed, then you're not going to have as consistent of a draw to pull that smoke through. Because you want to have it the same Roughly, yes, again, roughly. and there's all this weird stuff going on where the air is, the cool air is expanding up to maybe three times its volume and it's going faster and the pressures are changing and the volatile gases are adding some molecular pressures in the air. So there's a huge amount of complexity going on. And you can tweak it and do little tapers and little fins, like you can do a little tabbing thing and try to get it to make a tornado in there and draw faster and you can, you can tweak it as hard as you like, and you can get all kinds of cool effects. And equal cross-sectional area happens to just work really well and be super easy to do. Easy <laughs> so math easy math, easy construction, only one size of replacement parts. It's like. It, and you can build it with a rock and a tire iron. And some pieces of sheet metal, yeah. Um, I ran into this guy in Portland. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so these are some full-scale mass heaters. Uh, this is in an outdoor education center in Redwood Country in California. So you've got the, the, the horizontal going out and then back so, and then up. Yep. Yep. Fuel goes in, fire burns sideways and up, downdraft in the barrel, and then we've got a two, two run. And then we love to put the chimney near the barrel. Keeps the chimney warm, keeps your draft going. Usually this heat you're sacrificing by sending it up the chimney is heat that's hitting the exterior wall. So it's like, yeah, it's slightly less efficient, but really the losses are small. And it signals people, along with the ubiquitous coffee or teapot, that this is a stove and you might not want to put your like notebook on top of it as you walk into the room. It isn't the touching. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's the stove. So or putting your toddler on top. 
especially in educational facilities, even if you're building a super short system and you don't need the extra draft, if you're in a situation where the public are going to encounter these for the first time, this is a very nice way to show people what they're looking at. Okay. Is the exhaust and heated air coming <coughs> through that bench and yes. back out? Yep. Yeah, there is no bypass between the barrel and the chimney. It all goes here and comes back. Is there a picture of the stuff being previous to applying the concrete? We have one full build like sequence, yeah, but not on this stove. What's on the top? Yeah, what, what alternatives are there to a 55 gallon drum that might be more aesthetic? I have a whole thread on the permies.com forums about oil drum in my living room and alternatives. People have thrown up pictures of things you can buy online today that are like stainless cylinders or uh, those beautiful tile, metal tiles for ceilings that you could use to make a little heat shield around your barrel and just do an aesthetic upgrade. Uh, there's some work being done on masonry, but uh, masonry heaters are prone to cracking in the high heat areas. You've got temperature gradients. And so the, the, there's another thing we did in our house. <laughs> and again, we took a piece of mm -hmm. copper that Ernie picked up for a solar experiment, and we tied it on with a piece of wire. I mean, that's all we did. But doesn't it look nice? You know? Um, so you can do it. And there's a little air gap, and we've got a fan behind it, so we're still shedding that heat and getting that downdraft cooling effect in that barrel. Yeah. Uh, we're just shedding it to air instead of to radiant. So. Uh, I didn't see a clean out on, on the oh. around on the mast. Yeah. There is a clean out. Okay. And see on the, the second off? rock? I think, I think it's this rock. Okay. Third rock. Again, it's yeah. easier to see on our full build sequence where those clean outs are. So let's see if we can get to that. All right. This is the one in our house now in Tenasket. Uh, we don't have a clean out because we have a removable barrel and a removable lid. So we can just stick the shot back down from the top. But we do have a clean out as close as we can get it to that turnaround. And we have another one that you can just see the tape holding the, the cap seal right there. Um, anytime you got a 180 bend and the bottom of any vertical where you're going to have stuff falling down. That's where you want your clean outs. And the bottom of the barrel is your most commonly used clean out, most critical. Yeah, and like she Where's said. Where's the exhaust pipe? The exhaust on this, this is against an interior wall. And so we actually took the exhaust out because we were building this addition on. So we took the exhaust out this wall, up inside the building, to put it out through the new roof because it just simplified. It was a one month construction process. This is the, the first year we bought firewood because I had a month to either build the stove while the mud was thawed or go chop firewood that wouldn't be seasoned by the time we needed to burn it anyway. So, um, so, we, so we put the exhaust through into the next room and, and took it up indoors um, so that we could put it through the new roof and not have to cut into the old so roof. So there's only not 30 to 40 feet No, there is. There's, there a, there's is. about 15 there's a, or 20. It goes there and back. There's a clean out here. And then it goes out and up. So it's about 15, 20 feet of vertical pipe after about 20 feet of right. back and forth. So is there way back? Was that higher? Yes, it's higher. Center? It's up Yeah, back. it's in the back. You can actually, some of this rock that's flatter is because it's a shallower clearance. It's about three or four inch clearance to that pipe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, it, so it's lumbar heat right yeah. along there. It's awesome. Just imagine <laughs> the cushions. Yeah, no, so I actually. That was filled with gravel instead of like cob that you can you can dig at. Oh, you really have a little person roasting pit. <laughs> um, we've we've worked with Paul Wheaton on some of these portable systems that are filled with things like pea gravel or rock. Um, again, you have that concern like with the masonry heater thing. You're going to have cracks and leaks over time. It's a it's a thing. Things break, right? And so in this system, you've got metal that's providing your primary seal, and then you've got continuous earth and mortar that's providing a secondary seal. The metal could completely rust out, and you'd still have a seal. And if that seal reaches the surface as a crack, it's easy to see it and patch it. Some of the oldest masonry heaters from Afghanistan and, and, the, and Asia are a floor heater where you're just constantly resurfacing the floor with a clay-based or clay-dung plaster type of material anytime you see signs of degradation or cracking. Um, um, are you, are with, the, with the loose fill, it's very hard to see a leak. 
and there's, there's, there's a much greater potential for that leak to be reaching your room very quickly. What is your mortar mix that you're using? Clay and sand. Yeah, about three or four sand to one clay, depending on the quality of your clay. Uh, and I've been playing with the way air flows, okay? So to me, stove design isn't, isn't complete until I have figured out a way for it to vent all through your house. Oh, do we have having the, to add a fan? Or do we have the Bonnie one in here? I think so. Hold on. Okay, so where this plugs through the wall goes into a cabinet. And the cabinet has an air intake in the bottom and an exhaust out the top. So it keeps our bedroom warm. The cabinet is theoretical. Yes. What is actually there is Ernie's laundry pile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but any year now, he swears to me, we're going to have shelves and a cabinet. This is the... This is in Bonnie Dune, California. Believe it or not, it does get cold down there. Um, it's like here, it's a damp maritime climate. And so although the temperature might not impress somebody from Michigan, the, the heat loss to your body is fairly extreme because of so the dampness. If you, if you look down there underneath the Minoan squid and all along the bottom, there's little holes all the way down. Okay, And there's a four inch gap in the back of that stove. <laughs> Here you can actually see the bricks that, that, that are holding those, the, the stove up off of those channels. And so it all goes back like that. And then there's a big gap behind it here that feeds to this. And this has vents in the top. Um, so it's just a passive. It's like those blowers on all those fireplaces, except you've got this big mass that's collecting the heat. And then the, the passive air circulation is keeping the floor cool and moving warm air up, counteracting the downward flow off those windows. Oh, so the air goes in the bottom holes, yep. and they go all the way up back out. Yep. Yep. Okay. yep. yep. And the back is just a continuous, a bunch of large mm -hmm. voids. And it reverses that adiabatic flow down those windows. Um, this is in a 6,000 square foot house with a tower at each end. So it's, it's a lot of work to do that in a stove. Like those, in that well, it's a lot yeah. of work to make a rocket stove, so you might as well put in the put in the work at the beginning and, and get the most out of it. The most work that was involved in this was deciding which bricks were going under it and which bricks were going in it. I think yeah. we redid that decision about three times. Okay. So Swapping bricks out. <laughs> this particular building hadn't ever had heat up in those towers since those towers had been built. They had originally had central heating. They had mold. It was, it was put in through the crawl spaces under the house and, and the, they got really bad mold growth in the air ducts. And so it wasn't healthy to use the central heating. They've been trying to heat it off of a wood stove insert in one of these big, dramatic, concrete mortared river rock fireplace settings. And they were going through about eight cords of wood a winter. And this is a 5,000 square foot, three family house. Right? So it's a big, even, even though it's a milder climate, it's a big heating load. Um, and they put this in, and they still use two smaller wood stoves in the wings of the house for supplemental heat. And they're going through about two cords of wood a winter now. So just, just a dramatic difference if you're trying to heat with wood. So um, do you put like the thermal cob material directly around the stove pipe? That's yes. Stove? Yes. In fact, we'll deliberately pack about an inch of it around before we start adding things like you can add rubble and rock and infill. It doesn't all have to be cob. Uh, we've, got, we've got a couple examples now that are like ours is field stone and Ernie's dad's got one that's a brick you guys facade. Go through, like, Let's, I think we've got a step-by-step. -step. Yeah, this is, this is the one that we did as a case study for building code in Portland, Oregon. Um, and so we documented it very well. And we actually applied for a permit. And they, the landlady went down and said, I need a permit for this thing. And she had the book, and she had like the plans that we'd drawn out. And, and they were like, what is it? She's, is it a fireplace or a wood stove? And she says, well, it's this thing. It's, and she, the lady's like, does it burn wood? Yes? Well, then it's a wood stove. Here's your permit. <laughs> wood stoves are a category of appliance that's under about 1,900, 2,000 pounds by weight. So this is not legally a wood stove. But we had a permit, and it said just build it and call us again. <laughs> it says come inspect it. So okay. we did. <laughs> so then it was like this four-year process of we don't know what to inspect it for and helping to write some code. So they've just recently approved a one-week approval process. And, and the code that we helped write is being used as a, a way to let people build these legally in Portland, Oregon. So again, there are cleanouts in this. And yeah, the cleanouts so are behind the tiles. This one? See the little dimple? 
So you can pull the tile off and then pull the cap off the clean out. So the clean out's about three or four inches behind the tile. So Works really well. The kids don't even notice it until they drum their heels on it and it makes this cool noise. So <laughs> any, stove, any stove that you're going to build, doesn't matter what kind, masonry stove, rocket stove, standard box stove, if there is a clean out on it, if there is a thing that somebody can tinker with that is not you, hide it because they will absolutely tinker with it. There's another clean out about here. And this is how lazy we were on this build. Actually, it's a very practical solution. There was an existing electrical outlet here. We taped a cardboard box around it as a form and built the bench around it. And if we had moved it up the wall to where you could access it, then every time you sat on the bench, you'd be like rubbing the, the cord out of your, your laptop cord would get all bent up and it would be very unsafe. So this was a safety solution. Yeah. Um, so there was a rocket stove at, at Cobb Cottage Company that is in the tool library that somebody put in a paint can with a little lid with bubblegum pattern on it. They were designed and to be built from all reclaimed and recycled materials, no new stuff necessary to buy for this. So you can build a hundred dollar stove by just not counting all the gas you spent scrounging your materials. And in four years of being there as the caretaker, I probably spent a solid two months chasing that stupid paint can lid around to put it back on the stove because every group that came through, they take it and they wander off with it. There's a lot of paint cans and not all of them have lids and there's a lid stuck in you the want, you bench. Want you want your, you we want like our clean outs hidden. We like, we like to use conventional tees with stovepipe caps because people know what that is. And we like to hide it behind something that you're obviously not supposed to pull off because people are monkeys with fingers and we take stuff. Um, so this is the build process on that one. Uh, layout, measurement, we're measuring to get that cross-sectional area. Oh, okay, so here's where the firebox is gonna be. It's gonna, the barrel's gonna be here. This is kind of flopping around right now, but we're laying out, do we have enough pipe to go down to the end and back? Uh, how many T's are we going to put in? Are we going to try to put a T at those 90s? We ended up not doing that. We put a T here. And at the back wall there. A T. Or a T. T meaning yeah. where you can put a cap on one end to access it. And the, the gas will flow around there if the cap's shut. Um, and we ended up using a telescoping pipe here rather than a T because, again, we'd had to move the whole thing into the room another foot or so to put a T in the back. Uh, we've so you only cleaned out the front pipe then? Well, it doesn't, you don't get a lot of stuff in the pipe. You get a lot of fly ash right at the bottom of the barrel. Okay. And so that's your primary thing that you're cleaning. If you've got a nice big pit there and the fly ash settles out there, not a lot of stuff in the pipes. You can shove a vacuum hose in from either end. Uh, it's, it's useful if you duct tape the vacuum hoses together so you don't lose the vacuum <laughs> hose extension in the um, pipe. But it's not hard to clean it out. You don't need to be able to stick a, a hard brush in there and scrub it. So, so. back there where we put the tea, so we can get down both legs of that that back wall pipe underneath this front one because we used a telescoping vertical pipe it'll be clearer in further pictures just push up the all we had to do is push up the vertical pipe and then we can vacuum down into that so it looks like we did we couldn't get in there and then we made it so we could get in there yeah. um what material is that it's these are these are the picture, uh, that is. much it of is. this pipe is yeah. galvanized it doesn't get up to a high enough temperature to okay. melt Gal galvanized. Galvanized can starts to vaporize around 700 Fahrenheit, I believe. Yep. And so the exhaust itself is not that hot by the time it hits those pipes, let alone is the surface of the pipe going to get to that temperature. Um, so here, more than like yes. Uh, the little sticker that says UL approved for stovepipe increases the price by about a factor of five over what the material itself is worth. Like if you go buy, buy metal scrap. So um, there are places we did use double wall standard stovepipe up to code because this was a test case for code. So we'll see later places where we have stovepipe with stickers on it just to, so that it, it looks good. Um, and anything that if you have stovepipe or if you're getting a few pieces to make up the full length that you need, I'd put them in this first run where it's hottest. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so here we're getting closer. Here's the firebox. 
This is a temporary piece. We did not use this as the final installation. This is an insulated piece of stovepipe. Uh, and these will warp and burn out if you leave them in there as a long-term thing. They work great for demonstration. That one that Ernie was putting on and off, it's a great way to show the difference between insulated and uninsulated for demonstrations. And the inner wall of that one warped out from a couple of demonstrations yeah. it's been used on. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can see that kind of damage outside. Um, this is a weird little ducting fitting that we found that I think is designed for like uh, vent hoods for stoves when you go from round to square through your cabinet. Um, and so we use that to catch the ash, and then we're bringing it out to a clean out here. So we wouldn't. Say again. Can you use it like a drawer? No, no. It's just a way to catch a narrow slot that's the right cross-sectional area coming from the barrel, and transition. Again, we didn't know what whether they had some kind of standard they wanted us to meet as far as the structuralness of the connections between masonry and metal. So we're doing all these weird things that we don't normally do to try to make it back, impressive. <laughs> so you can see yeah. we've got stovepipe here. It's, it's recycled, but it is black stovepipe. And then we've got, here's one of the T's that we're using for a clean out. This T is going to end up here, like that, to and make this clean out. Protruding T part, like, is it flush against the, like, it, the T part protrudes? We set it in. It like we try to set it in so that as you're walking past it, you're not going to be snagging that stovepipe right, cap all the time. But where the cap is, there's a couple inches that come away from the main. Oh, channel. just in terms of gas flow, no, is that, that, that dead that's space? That's you want smooth, you don't want rough in the bench. You don't want corrugated. You don't want, if you can avoid the crimp, articulate, like, like the flexible elbows are good. The ones where it looks like Snuffleupagus's nose, where they just sort of crimped it down to make the elbow. A lot of drag. Each of those, one foot of that corrugated stuff gives you about 10 feet's worth of drag, where, a, where an adjustable it. smooth elbow gives you maybe five feet's worth of drag. So it's a huge difference. In Cobb in a way that looked well finished. We're going for kind of the IKEA aesthetic of rocket mass heaters as opposed to like the hippie trip aesthetic. Well, if you wanted to keep the ventilation underneath it, you could. Yes, you could. You could. With um, that. That's not channels, what we use that one. For. About a four inch channel is probably more effective for passive ventilation because you've got a lot of drag. Right. Um, but it does give you a little bit of air to help dry out the, the mass. So here's something I'm never going to do again that mm -hmm. little squared around piece is stuck in there directly where the barrel's going to fit right on those bricks directly underneath there and really I don't have any settlement space in this system at all it's a very tight system it works really well but it's too tight it's a 900 it have any slot. It's heating 900 square feet in Portland which is again a very mild heating climate and so you can get away with an annual clean out even with no ash space but it's close and you end up with chunks of fly ash that get kind of accumulate up around the barrel in there. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so mortaring the brick. Too tight, like, you, like, what would you do? <coughs> like, make it... I've got pictures later on a bigger, of better manifolds. Put a bigger manifold on it. Uh, we call it the manifold, the transition from the barrel to the ducting, usually with a clean out right in there. It's a, many spaces coming together. It's often a different shape for every build. Um, just stacking the bricks. We used reclaimed bricks on this. Um, uh, the modern hard-fired bricks built for use with concrete mortars are not optimal. If you can get the older soft-fired terracotta bricks, they actually seem to handle the heat better. Often you can get old fire brick that looks crumbly and yet it will stay in the same shape. It was crumbly because they knocked the fireplace apart without taking very much care of the bricks, right? Or somebody stuck concrete mortar on it and it flaked off part of the brick when it came off. Um, but this was, there were piles of this on the site, and so we used that material. It's, it'll, it'll handle up to about 2,000. Uh, we did get quite a lot of cracking in this brick over time. That's clay sand mortar. That, that right there is clay sand mortar with a little bit of lime in it because I had the lime. Yeah, the lime doesn't do you much good. It'll powder out, yeah. but it does set hard so a little the, bit faster. The brick are looking thing that's on the back. Again, that was, this is us obsessing over what they were going to care about and thinking they wouldn't be impressed with clay mortar. There, you can use clay. Don't use lime in high fire areas. Clay is a refractory material. Lime is not. All right. So the backing there is one inch. It has a one inch spacer behind it, between it and the wall. If you're going to put this to code, 
you're definitely going to want to do things like that. Yeah. The because go code mandates that you have if you're if you're within 16 inches. Just no, look up your inches. look up your code for an uncertified wood stove. The top yeah. of the barrel, you put a wood stove thermometer on it that shows you how hot you're burning, and it's very similar. Top third of the barrel is very similar to a wood stove in terms of surface temperature. So just use your local guidelines. Sometimes it's 36 without a heat shield, 18 with. Sometimes it's 18 to a foot. Like just it'll depend on how how your climate is, how fast things dry out. Yeah. Um, and so how obsessive your local code people are. If you were gonna make What I can dig out of the backyard. Okay. You can so you can often that with sand and with water sand. Um, yeah. Malleable yeah. Yep. If you're in a clay area where you don't have clay in the backyard, often you can put you can go to community colleges and see if they're collecting recycled clay mm -hmm. that ends up being weird mixed lots that are very problematic to turn back into ceramic clay, but they're happy to have them go to a good cause. So ceramic clay. Any any kind of pottery clay, anything from stoneware to porcelain. Um, you can buy 50 pound bags of Lincoln 60 fire clay um, for making mortars with. It's Very super cheap. cheap. It's, it's under 20 bucks a bag. 10 bucks, 10 bucks 10 12 bucks, something like that. It's called fire clay? Fire, it's called fire clay even though it's not already fired. Yeah, it's called <laughs> it's, Lincoln 60. It's used to make mortars for fireplaces. Okay, so, so it's like Lincoln 60. Yeah. Uh, in Portland area, we used to go to Georgie's Ceramics and just get their cheapest clay for potters that were making up their own stoneware mixes. So this is our first fire of it. Um, putting it together, you can see the T there behind Teresa. That's the clean out there. Uh, this is the perlite clay mix. It's just stiff enough that we can pack it. Um, no lumps of clay in there to diminish the insulation value. It's all mixed up clay slip. We insulated between the exterior wall and the mass just to save a little bit more heat on the inside. These walls are very poorly insulated. This is one of these scabbed together back granny flat apartment honeymoon weirdness thing. Bedroom used to be a chicken coop. <laughs> and they dragged it down the hill and took all the stuff out and replaced it with drywall and the windows are get really moldy in the winter. It was like a kind of a nasty apartment really but um, there was not much insulation in the walls, and so we insulated between the stove and the wall to put more heat into the house. It was a much more livable house after we were done. That's our clay mine. That's where we got the clay. Nice. This was used to be in a swimming pool. The, 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 the picture in the back, that's just pumice without clay? Not or? pumice, but perlite. Perlite, perlite is a pop popped, it's like rock popcorn. Um, pumice is much denser, and where you could use a couple inches of perlite, you need like 10, in 10 inches of pumice to get the same insulation. I'm a non-MAC user. So you're, you definitely so we're down here. right there. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. So you're pouring perlite with clay, or just perlite at that point with the dustpan? That's perlite and clay. I th whatever I had at that point, I wasn't being that picky because I had it sealed in my you don't want mass up against that out outside wall. Right, but you want mass up against the... Um, the if, if you wanted to meet masonry heater ASTM standards, you'd put a four inch air gap between the masonry and any combustible wall. Our masonry surfaces are s much cooler in this part than the masonry surface of a vertical masonry heater. Um, so our, our recommendation that we ended up using for the Portland code document was to put that four inch gap around the combustion unit masonry. If you've got any combustibles close to that, but, but that you don't need it around the thermal mass heat exchanger part. Yes. Have you had any experience with lime straw for that kind of insulation situation? For yeah, if you want it, uh, we've got one in, another one in Portland that's a clay straw insulated wall with the mass right up against it. Uh, I haven't used lime straw. I have. Yeah. 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 How many um, inches do you want? This for, for the wall, whatever you need, it's about the house, not the stove. Yeah. Okay. That's for the combustion area uh, and the heat riser, an inch of refractory rock wool, two inches of perlite or perlite clay, four inches of vermiculite, loose fill, do not mix vermiculite with clay, it loses its insulation value. Or uh, six to ten inches of pumice if you're trying to use pumice. 
Um, you can also get away with just a couple inches of kiln brick, that foamy ceramic brick. If you find a, a, an old pottery kiln that somebody's trashed and their electrical components are gone and they're not going to use it anymore, getting that kiln brick is a very, very effective material for and that space. Is straw clay equivalent to? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it really depends on how you make it and whether it's going to handle the heat or crumble. So if you want to make vernacular insulative ceramic materials where you're mixing chopped straw, sawdust, charcoal, coal dust with clay, you're going to want to fire it first and see how it lasts. You know, make yourself a little beehive with this brick, fire it up, or bake some pizza, pull it apart, and the part stuff that stays together, build with it. But don't, don't count on a natural built material that you haven't tested for that kind of performance. Essentially, your natural materials have too much variation to be able to give you a, 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 a hard and fast rule about it. Yeah. The, the perlite clay is probably the closest to a natural building material that performs really well for this application. So this is just clay and sand. We don't use straw in the thermal core of the stove. We use straw in the covering when we put the last two inches of, of material on. Straw but is a hollow core tensile fiber. It gives you good resistance to cracking and impact, but it's insulative. And so if you're trying to build thermal mass, you're going for density. If you're trying to put insulation in, you're going for foaminess, trapping little pockets of air. And so the straw is not useful as your first heat sink around the pipes. Does that make sense? It won't burn. You can put, if there's a piece of straw in there or a piece of leaf or something, it's, and you put it down at the end of the bench like here, it's going to be there as a fossil when people excavate this thing you years need later. Air on the outside that wouldn't be ins as insulating as straw. Well, yeah. Putting yeah. it on the outside for the plaster, yeah, use, yeah. use hair, straw, uh, whatever. Pet hair, like for barbershop right clippings. For thermal core, you want as dense a material as possible. This is our proof that, yes, it is, in fact, an owner built stove. This is our landlady. <laughs> helping us build the stove in our apartment. Um, this, is the, this is the first firing. Uh, we have it just shoved out the window. It stayed like that for like seven months. The, the, from, okay, this whole process is maybe three to five hundred dollars worth of materials. I mean, we've got a bunch of the ducting at the rebuilding center for like ten bucks, right? Uh, barrel, we got ten bucks. Uh, brick was already there. so. It's, you know, buying some perlite, buying, having a, you know, 100 bucks worth of a dump truck load of sand brought onto the site because no, no aggregate in the soils on the site. Um, from there through the roof, another thousand. So, this, so this, this was sort of waiting on the weather to be right and the, all of the parts to be in place for going up through the space with double wall, ceiling box. Um, barriers to keep the squirrels from shoving the insulation up next to the pipe. Um, I strongly advocate using up to code wood stove through roof chimneys if you're going to do anything that looks like a chimney, right? Because I have never seen someone who has an existing hole in their house go make another one when they want to put in a wood stove, right? So if you are not planning to take the house apart when you leave, um, you got to either make it up so that people can use it for a wood stove, or make it really clear that that's not what it's for. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to do that. Make right. something that somebody on their first wood stove install wouldn't think you were supposed to put a wood stove into. From the bottom of the stove to the top of that stack, we already had the triple wall. Everything else cost more than the rest of the stove put together. And it would have cost more than the rest of the stove put together if we'd have bought the first quart of wood. Wait, yeah. what cost more? Than the that black the stove chimney, pipe. That, this telescoping eight-foot section, the box, the insulation protector cage, the witch's hat that goes over the roof and interfaces with the, the chimney, the little, the little collar that keeps the rain from falling into the slots in the witch's hat was $27. I, and this was our third, like we got the roof slope wrong, so we'd had to go back already for the witch's hat. And then I had this collar, and the collar was the wrong size because we just, and I just, I was like, I cut it back an inch from the end, but I left the end with a sticker on it. <laughs> I made it the right size. <laughs> it's just like, it was just, 
And it's double wall or triple wall? Or it's double wall, double wall inside the room because that, again, is up to code. If it were a wood stove, we wanted, we wanted to have the inspectors come and poke it and prod it and see whether this is something that they thought people could be approved. And so we wanted a sticker and we wanted it up to current code for a wood stove, even though it's completely superfluous with the temperature of the exhaust that was going out that pipe. But if you're going to put one in, into a ret if you're going to retrofit one into a house, be prepared to go through all the all the cartwheels and everything to retrofit it into your house. Yeah. So if you've had a wood stove put in, it's a two to five thousand dollar job usually, and just be aware that a third to a half of that cost is this new stove pipe. And you're not going to be able to get around that if you want to do an up to code installation. Plastering. Straw. This is a dung plaster. Okay. Uh, believe it or not, dung plasters do not stink. Just so you know, you get a faint horsey smell for about two days and then it is gone. My, my old writing teacher was absolutely tickled to be asked to donate to this project. <laughs> Not particularly, no. It's also, um, after the animal chews it, or if you don't like the idea of working with a dung material, you can put straw in a barrel with a weed whacker and chop it up. If you take out the nodes, the little joints in the grass, you, what you've got is a material that's a flat fiber. It's no longer little tubes holding air. So dung or chopped straw is much less insulative than the whole straw with the little round tubes. So then why do you put it? I mean, why do you put that it's not for insulation. It's, this is kind of like any kind of natural material has multiple properties. Straw or fiber of any kind, you could use pet hair, um, gives you tensile strength so that if the material is try like clay shrinks and cracks, mm -hmm. if you don't have enough aggregate, the clay will make little cracks everywhere, right? So you put sand in as aggregate. Your straw is even better than sand at making something that the, as the clay pulls it, it just holds. It keeps it from cracking. And if somebody, um, I mean, Ernie's sitting on the couch with his cane or his crutches, and they're dropping and hitting the edge of the couch. If it's just masonry, that kind of hitting it over time is likely to make it chip. Whereas having fiber in there, it just gives it more resilience. So it's, it's not strength, it's toughness. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so and it's super important if you're building cob walls to have that strength, especially at the base of the wall and all the way up, so wind and things like that are gonna, gonna hit a tough surface. But for these, they're under two feet tall. Even if there was an earthquake, it's not gonna fall on anybody. So this is just after we finished plastering it. Um, it's not dry yet. And we've got all the doors open and we haven't run it for a while because we've been working on it. Uh, Brian, you had a question? So basically the concept is to get material that's gonna send the heat away the yes, so you're storing heat here, you're sucking all the heat out of the pipes that you can and storing it in this mass. And then the insulation is outside, around the walls, around you. You and basically. On the floor, too, floor and walls. So yeah, going under, and again, thermal mass on the floor, insulation under that, right? right? So you get, you want a core inside the house that's storing heat. If you've got concrete floors that are insulated, as, as uh, code says nowadays, so if the concrete floor is insulated with modern code, just build it on the floor because it's going to heat that cement up. And that just acts, acts as more thermal mass for you. Yeah. This is, um, incidentally, this is our videographer, Kalen, who videotaped the process of building that one with the channels under it in California. Um, and he's going to be putting that out this summer. He just did a fundraiser for the production cost. Soil around all of the pipes on top? Yes, all of the pipes, all of all of the pipes are encased in cob all the way around. Yeah, soil, uh, like a baby soils itself, is the fertile, great part of the soil for gardening. Subsoil or mineral soil is where you tend to look for building materials, um, and and cob as a building material is sand and clay with as minimal a silt content as you can achieve. So if it's good for gardening, it's bad for building, and vice versa. I think you covered that a little bit yesterday, a little bit. but a lot, a lot of, of people here weren't here yesterday. A so. lot of people uh, ask us why we have our coats on. It's because we've been plastering this dumb thing all day long. Going outside and mixing plaster. And this is in February. <laughs> and it's uh, January. And we're not running the heat. I, 
I think we probably shouldn't let the internet trolls determine how we do presentations <laughs> live. Um, this is showing the gap. So we did a cast refractory, like homemade refractory, using clay and perlite, um, tamping it down in between two layers of metal, and then taping over it to give it some stability so that we could move it from the outside worksite into you know, mortaring it in place and setting it in there. The outside casing remained intact over the four years that we were there. There's quite a bit of melting in this aluminum foil mylar tape <laughs> at the top, but there's still some of it intact down at the sides. And the interior pipe, uh, if it's here, it's off the ground up to about here, blisters up to about here, no metal below that, and some intact metal above that. So in terms of what, what material was that? Was that stovepipe or was that, that was stove ducting? That was stovepipe. OK. So we're, t we're looking at temperatures up to about 3,000 Fahrenheit happening on a regular basis in the lower part of that pipe. So is that the weakest? I mean, it's sacrificial. You don't need it to stay intact. No. If you if That's you use they... if you use metal, expect it to be sacrificial. Uh, same with if you insulate it with something like um, some people have used fiberglass, like glass wool insulation instead of rock wool, and that is a much lower temperature material. And so when it melts, it melts completely, and then you lose your insulation value, and your thing stops working. Does that style heat riser work better than the bricks? No. It's quicker to build in a setting where you have lots of hands to help and not enough space to put them all on the job at the same time. Can you use passable refractory? Yes. Yes. Yeah, again, it's you want right it rated 3,000 degrees would be good. Um, they sell it in tubes. They, they sell it. There's a, several industrial ceramics manufacturers that will make tubes for industrial foundries that you can put around a pipe, certain ID tube. Yep. Um, so something like that, again, easy to put in place without a lot of labor hours happening around the heat riser. What about borosilicate? Borosilicate melts <coughs> at a lower temperature than steel does. Oh. Check your refractory's rating. There are things. silicate melts at 3,000 and over. There are things that are sold as refractory uh, that only yeah. handle up to about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So check, do not look at whether it says high heat, look at the temperature it's rated for, and that covers all your materials. You can research right. each material yes. yourself. Can you create, mix your own insulative cob and use it? In that's yes. what the that's perlite, what that's clay perlite clay is. And clay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But so that's... Inside metal, could you sculpt it with, to skip the metal? Could to you freeform it? sculpt it, yeah. uh, I, I'm sure that there are some people with that kind of skill. I will tell you that I have personally not ever met anybody with that kind of skill that can freeform sculpt perlite and clay at um, the right ratio. You're working a balance because insulin. the perlite is friable, it's crumbly, it's loose, and if you have just enough clay to hold it together when nothing's thumping on it, you've got your maximum insulation value. If you put enough clay in it to make it a malleable thing that you can put on in lumps, uh, then you're going to need a lot more of it to get the same insulation value. Does but that make when, sense? But when the metal fades away and blisters away, then is that going to... If it's perlite and clay, no, because if the clay you've got vitrifies enough, and holds perlite in place. If you've got enough clay, it won't. Um, <laughs> yes. That's why we prefer brick. Good luck. It's I worth trying, and it's difficult. It's exceedingly difficult, and the problem with it, and, and your stove will smoke constantly until the sawdust completely burns out, which can take, if you're talking four inches, uh, it could take anywhere to about 10 years to burn out. So I, I recommend hard. making the insul vernacular insulative ceramic, like making your own kiln brick and then building with the kiln brick after you burned it in a controlled okay. fire. On this stove, lots of people ask why it's shiny. The reason why it's shiny is we had extra soap. Okay, if we, you want to put a gloss on the outside of cob, burnish it, soap works just dandy. This was basically our honeymoon, wasn't it, building yes. this stove? Yeah. I mean, there was technically a trip to go see some boats and help with those, but um, it's, uh, so we had a lot, like somebody gave us a whole bunch of natural soap for our wedding and more than we could use in 10 years. It's, um, Traditionally, a lot of people use oils or waxes to finish earthen floors so that they have a waterproof finish. Um, I think it was Kiko Denzer who took a floor sample down to his local office to say it's a meets health code and poured a Rob Bowman. Rob okay, Bowman. poured a can of Coke on it and poured it off. 
Oh, yeah, and it's just like this is, uh, there's, this is a perfectly hygienic material. It can be cleaned and so on. If you put beeswax on a heated cob floor, however, as it Shannon Daly found out, um, it becomes malleable again every time you run your stove. Beeswax is a heat setting material, like, like as it cools it hardens. Linseed oil is an oxidation curing material, so it will cure hard, but it stinks to high heaven until it's finished and, and, setting. And when you heat your floor that's been treated with linseed oil and beeswax, it turns very, very sticky and you tend to leave your socks behind. <laughs> yeah, so, so not using beeswax or any kind of a non-drying oil on hot earthen material surfaces. Um, and so the soap has an oil content, but it doesn't get sticky. But it still gives you the ability to burnish something into that that fills in some of the pores and lets spills kind of run off rather than into the earthen materials. Soap sounds like a pretty generic term. Can you get more specific? Uh, I, I can't olive remember if it was an soap. olive oil or coconut oil soap. Oil and you soap. said non-drying oil, so tongue oil, which is a drying oil. If, is, is so the distinction here is an oil like olive oil for cooking will stay liquid in the bottle for years. You can pour it into a dish and it will stay liquid in the dish for years. It's gonna smell funky and have stuff in it, um, but it's, it doesn't oxidize quickly. And that's kind of healthy when you're cooking with it because you don't want to be eating polymers necessarily. You're, you, you'd rather eat something that, that has a digestible oil. Um, materials like linseed, um, actual tongue oil. Drying oils are, are fine on this. You just gotta be careful about the ones with aromatic. Well, this bench was, was perfectly lovely scented in lavender. It was a lavender soap. <laughs> Daily to weekly ash clean out, annual ash clean out. Um, we have barrels that have lasted 15 to 20 years and don't show any signs of needing to be replaced yet. So this is much more durable than something like the, the, you know, the, the bar burn barrel style model. Uh, um, your, your, your Vermont casting stove will not last 20 years. So, of but constantly. we expect the barrel to be the first part to go. The other thing that goes first is here you've got holes are coming in, extreme heat moving horizontally, and there's one brick that's exposed to both, and yeah. it also gets thumped and pressured every time you try to torque that piece of wood in that almost fits but only in one orientation. Right? And so this, the first brick of the wood yeah. tends to crack, and it will often crack within the first year. Yeah. Um, so we tend to build those so that is a replaceable component just like the brick liner on a, on a wood stove. I've gotten the stoves up to where they're dependable. They do what they're supposed to do. You can build one with, with a fair amount of confidence that it is going to work the way it's supposed to be supposed to work if it's sited the way that you're told to site it. But I can't fix everything for everybody, but I damn sure want to give them the best possible chance of getting heat in their house.